Hello campers and welcome aboard the Starship Nightwish. My name is Commander Exorcist and welcome to part three of my series on exploration in Elite Dangerous. For this episode, we're moving past the basics and into some more advanced topics as far as exploring individual systems out in deep space. Now some of this information takes time and practice. And over that time and practice, you'll develop kind of a sixth sense, um, a bit of intuition that can make your exploration forays into deep space a lot more enjoyable and a little bit easier overall. Now for this video, it's called Advanced System Exploration or Advanced System Analysis. We're going to talk about system arrival. There are some things that explorers need to pay attention to when we get into a new star system. We're going to talk about the full spectrum scanner. I've got quite a bit to say about that one. We're going to talk about key planetary indicators. There are some things that over time explorers should come to understand about how uh, the galaxy in Elite Dangerous is built. And these key planetary indicators can help you find some amazing locations with relative ease. Then we're going to talk about some advanced map analysis, things that you can do to get the most out of the system map. Let's start with the advanced system arrival. Now, if you've played Elite for any amount of time, you have jumped your ship from one system to another, and heard that magical frameshift drive charging, and then you have exited hyperspace in the extremely violent way that you do, and a star has appeared in front of you. Now, the cool thing about Elite is that it provides a lot of information. The cockpit is filled with information, but not everything that we see in the cockpit is necessary for our particular gameplay style. So, for a combat pilot, you may just want to see what other ships are in the system. You may not care that you've just discovered an asteroid cluster, but for an explorer, there are some things that we really want to pay attention to that can help make the exploration activity um, much easier to handle. Now, for this uh, screenshot here, this is the cockpit of the greatest ship in the Elite Dangerous inventory, the Anaconda. This is the cockpit of the Nightwish. We're going to take a look up here in the top right, and you have a uh, set of information, and this appears anytime that you hyperspace into a new star system, and you'll get a collection of information showing your frameshift status, uh, fuel scooping status, and anything else that might want to show up, some uh, sig signal sources. But out in deep space, the thing you want to pay attention to is the discovered notifications. Here we've discovered a system with 37 bodies, so the orbital plane has been established. Our discovery scanner has honked this system and we're ready to begin scanning with the FSS. And you'll see below it that it's discovered a couple of different locations, an A belt, which is an asteroid cluster, and then another planet, another planetary body. I just want to mention, because sometimes it can be confusing, especially when you see things like this, when it says discovered, that does not mean that you are the first person to discover said location. That means that your character has had its first interaction with that particular celestial body. So being that my ship just scanned this location, I may or may not be the first person to discover this location. So don't think that you're the first person to discover Earth when you enter into the Sol system and it says that you've discovered Earth. So just pay attention to these kind of things. It's it's one of those um, one of those little quirks of the Elite Dangerous system, especially in the cockpit. Pay attention to um, the discovered information. It's very important stuff that comes up here, especially if you have a sensor system that's uh, engineered out and picks up bodies from a long distance. You'll see a lot more things popping up um, showed as uh, as discovered, but you won't really know if you're the first to discover it until you check the system map. And if you're not the first to discover it, you'll notice it. If you are the first to discover it, get to Universal Cartographics, sell your data, and get that good credit payout. Now, I want to talk about location information because this is another one that can kind of seem elementary, but it's a little confusing at times. And so again, we have our cockpit, and this time we're going to turn our attention down here to the bottom left. And we have two locations. Now, I'm on a route traveling about um, 20,000 light years, and 
I have just jumped into a system, I am fuel scooping, and I am preparing to jump to my next location. You'll notice that there are two systems identified, JCC C13602 and OIA C142698. This one up here, it has a solar system icon. Now, for me, I, my first thought is, well, that's the system that I'm in now. For some reason, I think these icons are backwards because that is actually the system that I am targeting. That is my destination. This is my current location, the OIA C142698. So when you're looking at your cockpit, especially if you're traveling in deep space, make sure that you know the difference between your destination and your current location. Now, why is this a big deal? Well, let's say that you've made an incredible discovery. Some wonderful ringed world, oxygen world with geysers, and it's just the most beautiful place in the galaxy. And you can't wait to get back and share it with your friends to sell it in Universal Cartographics and then post it. And then you put down the JCC C13602 system instead of the correct system, which I have done on several occasions, unfortunately. What you've done is you ended up with a 42.3 light year deficiency in your charting. And you're never going to find that system again, most likely. So it's important that you know where you're located and that you're documenting the correct location when you're documenting your discoveries. This is very important. I mention it because I've done it a few times. It's heartbreaking to lose a discovery because I put the wrong system name down. And it's really difficult easy to get mixed up, especially with the icons. The solar system seems like it should be the location you are, and the star should be the location you're going, but this is what we're dealt with, and it's what we learned to live with. And then we have, obviously, our fuel intake. Please do your best to manage your fuel appropriately. Do your best not to get stuck out in the middle of nowhere. The fuel rats are always there to help out. They love to help you out, but it's best to try and not to need them as best as possible. Now, when we get into a star system, once you've jumped into a new system and you're ready to begin exploring, there are a couple of ways to know immediately if there's interesting things to see or if there are, uh, if the system's already been explored. You can look immediately and know if a star system has been surveyed by another commander or by yourself um, with a couple of little tricks. Now we're back to our cockpit. And for this particular exercise, let's take a look down here at our sensor system. So we've entered into this star system. We have scanned it. And you'll notice the orbital plane is 37 bodies. So we know there's 37 planets and moons in this star system. But there's nothing showing up on our sensor system, just the central star. This is an indicator that nobody has scanned and turn this system information in to a universal cartographics location. It is an unexplored star system, or at least an unscanned star system. And so what it looks like if you had jumped in and it was explored would be something like this. You can see that the sensor system is covered in planetary bodies and is filled and so now we know, looking just at our sensors, if you were out in the black and you jumped into a star system and you saw something like this, you know immediately that you've stumbled into something that was previously uh, identified and explored by another commander, or maybe you did it yourself and you've somehow managed to loop back around, which if you do that in 400 billion stars, good, good job. It's, that's really, really good. Now, let's talk about the full spectrum scanner. Now, this particular uh, activity, this module, this mini game, it keeps some people up at night with their frustration and dislike for it. And I can understand some of the uh, disagreements and, and the dislike for the FSS, but um, it is much better than what we used to have. Let's just say that it is a nice trade-off. The full spectrum scanner is the utility that we use to scan bodies in a star system. Now, it was introduced a few years ago in one of the Beyond Chapter updates, and 
before we had the FSS, you had to visit each individual planet and scan that planet with your sensor system if you wanted to get credit for discovering or exploring that star system. So the one I showed earlier that had 37 bodies, that's 37 worlds, planets, moons, and the like that I would have to visit uh, to get credit for them. These days with the FSS, it's just a matter of jumping into the system and pointing my scanner at the individual bodies in the system and scanning them. So it has added a little bit of a mini game, which I recommend doing it with an Xbox controller. It works really well. It's difficult to do with a HOTAS or a, or a, um, or a flight stick, but it works really well with a controller. It feels like it was kind of designed for something like that, to be honest. And, um, it's a nice trade-off versus having to go out and visit all of those different planets. Now, let's talk about proper ship placement after hyperspace. Once you jump into a star system, your ship is basically dead facing a 90 degree plane, uh, an orbital plane. And so you can imagine coming to the edge of a plate and you have all of the planets out on this flat orbital plane. Now, there's obviously some... Um, some differences here and there as far as inclinations and eccentricities. But for the most part, most of the planets in the system are going to be on this flat orbital plane around the central star. And so when you hyperspace into a new star system, you are facing that plane directly. And if you scoop fuel underneath the star, let's say you're traveling to another star, another waypoint, you scoop underneath the star, come out on the other side of the star, point towards your waypoint and then fire up your FSS, you're going to run into the problem potentially, most likely, honestly, of uh, not being able to scan all of the uh, planetary bodies in a system because they're going to be hidden behind the central star. And so one of the things you want to make sure that you do when you've entered into a new star system and you're going to open the FSS to scan those bodies that you fly either under or over the star, do your fuel scooping, but then loop out as far as you can, kind of in an eccentric pattern. Uh, make it random, but you really want to put some distance on both the X and the Y axis and make an offset that central star as much as possible so that you're, you're opening up that window away to move those planets away from that orbital plane so that when you fire up the FSS, you're able to point your scanner in the right direction and scan the planet without having to worry about whether the central star is blocking uh, your sensor's ability to scan or not. Now let's talk about the spectrum analyzer. This is one of the best features um, to come to Elite Dangerous uh, Exploration in a long time. I love this thing. And kudos to Commander Corin Laith. I hope that I have said that name correctly. I apologize, Commander, if I butchered it. This is an amazing uh, diagram that he created. It is out on the web. You can do a search for it. The Filtered Spectral Analysis Diagram. But basically... The FSS breaks down the different elements of star systems into these categories. And so um, everything in these star systems, as it does in nature, exists on a spectrum. And so with the spectrum, um, you know, Elite, they've put all of these uh, celestial bodies onto this uh, spectral analyzer. And when you enter into a star system, you can tell based on the detected radio waves, even before you scan a, a planetary body, you can kind of get an idea of what kind of planetary body it is. You know that it's a gas giant or it's a ringed um, gas giant or it's a, a, a rocky ice world of some kind or maybe it's a chance at being an Earth-like world or whatever. Um, this is a fantastic tool. And... In my personal opinion, to get the best uh, out of the FSS and the spectral analyzer, get this, download this particular diagram that I have up on the screen, and um, you know, keep it kind of in your toolkit. It's a great reference to go back to to kind of show you with a, in in um, in a really concise way what uh, what you're looking at when you're exploring a new star system. Now. Let's talk about some common planetary configurations. Elite Dangerous's galaxy is, 
built on procedural generation. So somewhere there's a seed number and then there's procedures and functions and everything based on a variety of different um, variables that come together to form the galaxy that we know. Eventually, when you have 400 billion stars and your combinations are, they're going to start repeating to a certain degree. And that's not to say that everything in the galaxy looks the same. That's an excuse that you'll hear sometimes. But the reality is that we see a lot of the same thing through telescopes in the universe. We see a lot of M-class stars. We see a lot of ringed gas giants. We see rocky moons all over the solar system. And so, you know, it's, it is a, there's, comes a point where you start to see patterns across the galaxy. Now what you're looking at on the screen is a standard star system. This is a typical um, kind of boring, regular, I don't want to call it really boring, but it's a standard star system that you're going to see out in the middle of nowhere. You've got a couple of planets scattered here and there. You've got an asteroid belt. You've got a ringed gas giant, which it is the most massive and the largest body, and so it has collected a lot of the smaller bodies in that solar system, and they have it. Ha they're his moons, and this is what we see in our our uh, our current solar system. You know, Jupiter has the most moons, and and because it's the largest, most massive uh, object, and so it collects a lot of them. And you're going to see this in Elite Dangerous in a lot of the um, the deep space. Uh, solar systems, you're going to see these configurations where you have these massive gas giants and they have a variety of moons. But what I want to focus on is in the center here, you have this moon of a moon. It's a moon moon. Yes, that's a thing. I'm calling it a moon moon. Just bear with me. So you have a moon moon. So you have the gas giant and you have a moon, which that the larger moon is probably 1200 kilometer radius. But then you have this little tiny moon here. And when it comes to exploration, and especially looking for geologic activity, most of the time, even if the entire system is dead, most of the time, if you have a moon that is like this, orbiting another moon, and it's close to its gas giant, most of the time it's going to have some form of geologic activity. It might be the only body in the system that actually has geologic activity, but it will be there. And that's really cool because that's actually based on what we've learned over the years in relation to a similar setup in our own solar system with the moon Io over Jupiter. Now, Jupiter has many, many moons, but a couple of its most famous are Europa and Io. Europa is the cold one. Io is the one that kind of looks like cheese pizza, and it's extremely hot. It's extremely hot because it's pulled and it's influenced heavily by the gravitational pull of Jupiter and the gravitational pull of Europa. So the two of them are fighting it out, and Io is caught in the middle. And over time, it's become superheated, and its core is just extremely unstable, and it has its just entire surface is littered with this volcanic activity. And that's what we see in Elite. We see a lot of these worlds that kind of follow the same uh, scientific processing when it comes to their construction. The smaller moons tend to have geologic activity because they're influenced by that gravitational pull from the other bodies. Now, I have these three moons highlighted because sometimes you'll find that um, the top three or four moons down from a gas giant will have geologic activity, but the rest won't. Sometimes they won't, sometimes they will. Usually at least the first um, two or three will have geologic activity. And those moons, their, um, their development and their geography, geology, is based on the famous Europa, um, the ice moon of Jupiter, which is geologically active, has a subsurface ocean, has geysers and the like. And so you'll see a lot of moons in deep space in Elite that are really molded after Europa as far as their composition, um, even their surface features, and um, just you know how their geology um, is set up. 
Also, you'll have planets where occasionally you'll find one or two planets that are by themselves really close to the star, uh, and they'll have geology, but a lot of times you'll find these planets that are in pairs. So here we have two planets, landable worlds. Both of these planets have geologic activity. They orbit close to the star, but pay attention to the small bracket above them. The bracket is very important because when you see a bracket on the system map, that means that those two worlds are connected to each other through a mutual, like a, like a central gravitational point. So not only do they orbit the star, but they are orbiting a um, shared mutual gravitational point between each other. So there's a good chance that they orbit very close to each other, especially if they don't have an atmosphere and they're smaller. They may orbit very close to each other and they can be prime opportunities for geologic activity and research and photography. Makes great photography uh, targets when it comes to uh, being close to stars like that. Let's talk about some advanced map analysis and we're going to go over some key planetary indicators. There are a few things that um, in Elite we get a lot of information. There's a lot of data that comes with exploration, especially in the FSS. We don't need all of it. And over time, explorers tend to learn what it is we need to pay attention to, what's important, and what's not. And so just want to do a quick rundown on some of the key indicators that I search for when I am doing my scans in Elite. So first off, I look at radius. The smaller the body in Elite, the more exaggerated and the more pronounced surface features are going to be. So um, larger bodies are, tend to have smoother surfaces, less defined mountain ranges, smaller canyons, and the like. Gravity. It's very important that you know your ship's limit. Gravity is important because it pulls you down. And I know that the Nightwish, we have a standard operating policy that we do not land on planets that are beyond 3.5 Gs. Um, the ship is capable of taking up to 4 Gs, but it's just not safe. The engines are not designed for that kind of punishment. And so make sure that the gravity is appropriate for your landing zone. Um, there are planets out there with 7 and 8 Gs, and you want to make sure you're not um, speeding into one of them and unaware of what you're getting yourself into. Especially relevant in Elite Dangerous Odyssey is atmospheres. Atmospheric information is critical to understanding whether or not it's worth your time to explore. Have you seen 17 carbon dioxide worlds in a row? Great, time to move on. Maybe now you've got a, a water atmosphere world or an ammonia world or something unique. And so atmosphere is very important, gives us an opportunity to see what it is that we're... Um, you know, what we can go see if it's uh, oxygen, ammonia, sulfur dioxide, or whatever it tends to be. So atmosphere used to not be much of a deal, but with Odyssey, it is a key indicator now. And then we're going to talk about something that tends to get overlooked, orbital inclination. Orbital inclination is the amount of, al of uh, alignment this is the amount of, of kind of an offset or an altitude that you have for the orbital plane of the body in relation to its host. So let's think about this. If you have a body that is 90% orbital inclination away from its host, say it's a ringed gas giant, and the moon is 90% orbital inclination, it's going to look something like this. This is a location that I discovered a few years ago near Colonia, and this moon has a 90 degree orbital inclination. And looking on the galaxy map, on the system map, it's not really that special. It's just another moon. But considering uh, the orbital stats, it's quite a place to, uh, to visit. This one in particular was discovered a few nights ago before I made this video, and it has an inclination of about 10 degrees. And again, on the map, it looks perfectly normal. It's not very interesting, but when you get there, you realize that these little differences in our um, understanding of the key planetary indicators, things like orbital eccentricity and orbital, inc orbital inclination, 
um, that makes a difference in what we're able to discover and what we're able to experience in the Elite Dangerous Galaxy. So if you're looking for amazing places to photograph, orbital inclination is something that you definitely do not want to skip on. And then we're going to talk about examining for interesting topology. And we're going to finish on this, but um, interesting topology and interesting geography. Um, the most important thing to remember when it comes to searching for interesting topology in Elite Dangerous is do not put your faith entirely in the system map. It's not an Elite Dangerous Odyssey problem. It's just an Elite problem. It's always been around. The map lies. It doesn't tell the whole truth. A lot of times you can pull up a planet and its surface will look flat and uninteresting. Um, or maybe it'll have a small mountain range and it just really doesn't capture, um, you know, the height and the impact and the, the visuals of what it would really look like. So sometimes you just have to take a gamble and fly your ship out there and see what you can find. Um, but really, when it comes to the topology and looking at geography of these worlds, um, look for small crevices um, mountain ranges that appear as small grooves or um, jagged patches across planets. On the map, they may look small, they may look uninteresting, but again, the map does not do these locations justice most of the time. A lot of times you just got to get out there and see the planet for yourself. Take some pictures and, you know, roll the dice. It may not be worth it, but most of the time it's going to be. So take the time, scroll across the planet surface in the map, see if you can find anything that's even remotely interesting. Um, sometimes you'll find crevices and craters and um, large channels, and especially on the icy worlds. And it may be one of those things where it's like, eh, this looks interesting. And if you and if you even think about it, if there's a hesitation, a moment where you're thinking, oh, this is kind of interesting, go check it out. You never know, because the map is not entirely accurate when it comes to uh, to representing planets. Oh, by the way, the shadows are wrong on the map. They've always been wrong. So if you see something on the map that shows in daylight, it's going to be in the darkness when you get there. Um, just wanted to throw that out there. So, And that really wraps it up for part three of my series. I'm really enjoying getting to do the exploration videos and to share some of the stuff that I've learned throughout the years. And I hope that this is beneficial to some people. And um, if you have tips or tricks or some things that I've mentioned and you'd like to make comments, please leave a comment below. I try to answer as much as I can. I read them all and I, I try to get involved as much as I can with the discussion. Just sometimes I'm not able to, but um, I do read them all and I do appreciate the comments that I get and the support. If you're interested in supporting the channel, supporting my content, there are links below for you to uh, be able to support. And um, I really look forward to uh, what comes next because we haven't even made it down to the planet surface yet. There's a lot to do on the planet surface as well. So, and I think that's where we're going next. But in the meantime, you guys stay safe out there. Um, fly safe, watch your backs, the Thargoids are around, and um, I will see you guys out there.